All right, uh, I think we should start. Uh, welcome everyone to the sixth session of Afro-Asian Exchanges, the webinar series of the Center for Asian Studies in Africa at the University of Pretoria, or CASA for short. My name is Alf Nelson and, and I'm the director of CASA. I also work as a professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Pretoria. As some of you might already know, CASA is a new initiative at our university, launched late last year, that is uh, intended to work as a key hub of research in the field of Asian studies and the study of Afro-Asian connections in South Africa and on the African continent more generally. CASA is currently in its first year of substantial activity and much of our current efforts gravitate around building relationships and fostering conversations between scholars in and of the Asian and African continents across research fields related to global challenges such as inequality and human development, democracy and human rights, and sustainability and environmental justice. Today, we're extremely happy to be able to host Professor Lynette Chua from the National University of Singapore. Lynette is a law and society scholar with research interests in legal mobilization, legal consciousness, and rights, power, and resistance. She is Professor of Law at National University of Singapore with a joint appointment at Yale and US as Rector of Elm College and Head of Studies for the Double Degree Program in Law and Liberal Arts. She is also President of the Asian Law and Society Association and, I'm happy to say, a member of CASA's advisory board. Lynette is the author of, author of several books. Her first book, Mobilizing Gay Singapore, Rights and Resistance in an Authoritarian State, which was published by Temple University Press in 2014, is an ethnographic study of Singapore's gay and lesbian movements and the complex role of law and meanings of rights under authoritarian conditions. The book received the 2015 Distinguished Book Award from the ASA Sociology of Law section and the 2015 book Accolade for the ground for Groundbreaking Matter from the International Convention of Asian Scholars. Uh, it was also selected as a finalist by the Social Legal Studies Association for the 2015 Hart Social Legal Prize for Early Career Academics. Her second book, The Politics of Love in Myanmar, LGBT Mobilization and Human Rights as a Way of Life, was published by Stanford University Press in 2019 and explores how human rights are collectively mobilized and practiced on the ground, how they relate to larger social forces, and how the emotions and relationships that people have with uh, through human rights perpetuate their practice and construct their meanings. The book was awarded the Asian Law and Society Association's 2019 Distinguished Book Prize and, honor, and the Honorable Mention for the 2019 Gordon Hirabashai Human Rights Book Award by the Human Rights Section of the uh, American Sociological Association. Today, Lynette is joining us to talk about her most recent book, The Politics of Rights in Southeast Asia, which was published by Cambridge University Press last year. She'll obviously tell us much more about the book in just a minute, but I will say that in this text, which is part of the Cambridge Element series, Politics and Society in Southeast Asia, Lynette develops the law and society theory of uh, politics of rights as the analytical entry point to understand rights in a culturally and politically diverse region, uh, such as Southeast Asia. With this monograph, she hopes to provide a view of the politics of rights from the global South region and from the ground to encourage more astute evaluations of the power and limits of rights. Our discussion for today's webinar is Professor Srila Roy from Witts University in Johannesburg. Srila is a professor in the Department of Sociology at Witts, and her longstanding research interests and expertise uh, is in the field of transnational and decolonial feminist studies. She is the author of Remembering Revolution, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2012. This is one of the first full-length monographs uh, on the gender and sexual politics of India's Nakshabari revolution, a predecessor of contemporary Maoist struggles in the region. She's also the editor of New South Asian Feminisms, published by Z Books in 2012, uh, which has also been translated into Turkish. She is co-editor with myself of the collection New Subaltern Politics, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2015, and her second monograph, Changing the Subject, Feminist and Queer Politics in Neoliberal India, which maps, uh, yeah. maps the rapidly transforming terrain of gender and sexual politics in India under conditions of global neoliberalism. The book was published by Duke University Press in 2022. In the same year, she co-edited with colleagues at WITS and in India, uh, a volume of essays on Me Too uh, across uh, in India and South Africa called Intimacy and Injury, which was published by Manchester University Press. She's currently writing a collection of essays on decolonizing higher education in the global south, 
through the lens and promises of transnational feminism. So housekeeping for our webinars is fairly simple. Lynette will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of comments from Srila. After a brief response from Lynette, we'll then open up uh for comments and questions from the audience which can be put in the chat box or using the mic so with that i hand the floor to lynette good afternoon uh and good morning uh, i'm honored and delighted to be invited to speak at the sixth uh webinar by the center for asian studies in africa and thank you very much to professor nielsen for uh, this opportunity uh, to share my new work and my ideas with all of you as professor nielsen mentioned uh, i am basing today's talk on a recently published monograph in the cambridge university press's element series called politics and society in southeast asia and the monograph itself is politics and rights in southeast asia um so let me begin by sharing with you how I came about to uh, writing this volume. When I was invited by the series editors, they actually wanted me to focus on uh, and the uh, direction was in less than 30,000 words, which is uh, quite typical of the element series. They are really short, shorter monographs. And so to write about human rights in Southeast Asia at any length, to me is a tall order. It's a very diverse and very poor region. So a, a legal scholar might have someone who would accept the task perhaps, or might have gone about examining uh, the degree of human rights imp implementation in each of these uh, 11 Southeast Asian nations, maybe uh, looked at the compatibility of an international human rights regime in these uh, national contexts and perhaps comparing them across the region, but that's not what I do. And that wasn't what I wanted to do for the volume. So in the end, after some discussion with the editors, uh, I settled on the focus on what became the title, uh, The Politics of Rights. And that is to introduce in the volume, the socio-legal study of politics of rights, which has its origins in American law and society uh, literature. Use that framework as a, as a framing to understand rights not in the Northern Hemisphere, but in a culturally and politically diverse uh, region of the, of the South, uh, particularly uh, Southeast Asia. And the emphasis of that framework would be uh, its empirically grounded nature and the way in which it, it treats or analyzes rights as social practices. And of course, I'll say a little bit more uh, about that. So for the rest of my speaking time, I'm going to first set up the Southeast Asian context. And I hope through that you can appreciate why the politics of rights framing as adjusted to the uh, to, to that region is helpful to the study of rights. And then I'm gonna go on to elaborate on three key concepts underlying politics of rights. Then I'll develop an analysis of rights in Southeast Asia using uh, this framework. This analysis is also divided into three parts, organized around three sets of questions that traditionally have motivated the law and society or social legal study of rights. The first is, what are the structural conditions that influence the emergence of rights mobilization? The second, how do people mobilize rights and in what forms uh, does rights mobilization take? The third, what are the consequences of rights mobilization and how do we assess them? So uh, due to time constraints, I might not be able to cover all three equally, uh, especially the final point, but I'd be happy to take questions and say more in the discussion uh, segment. So let me go now into the first uh, section, substantive section. Um, when I was asked to write, this book, uh, I was confronted with three major challenges for anyone who wanted to study rights in Southeast Asia. So here, let me introduce to you the, the, the Southeast Asian context and put it in relation to why politics of rights as a framework is conducive. The three major challenges are, one, the diversity of the region, um, the divergent interpretations, adaptations, and uses of rights by actors with very different positions and experiences. And third, uh, correspondingly, contrasting and often contradictory outcomes and evaluations of rights. So a little bit more about the three challenges. The first challenge, 
uh, the region's diversity stems from, for one, the numerous political and legal social orders. Uh, just very briefly, uh, this is a region of a population of 650 million people from people who claim a mix of indigenous and immigrant roots, people living in cities, villages, highlands, and forests. Um, and there are 11 sovereign nations with uh, highly different political orders. They include the democratic republics like Philippines, uh, Indonesia, Singapore, and Timor-Leste or East Timor, constitutional monarchies like Cambodia, Malaysia, and Thailand, abs an absolute monarchy like Brunei, one party communist states like Vietnam and Laos, and at the time of this writing, a military dictatorship in Myanmar. And each of these states, well, let me say, especially the largest states, they also govern through uh, different layers of administration, uh, from the federal to provincial municipalities and villages. And each of these states have their own legal orders, so on and so forth. And in addition, in each of these societies, there are multiple social orders or, or what we call non-state normative orders uh, coexisting alongside the formal orders of the state. These social orders, uh, some are based in the world religions of Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, and Islam, and also in more local animistic faiths, and also uh, social orders uh, in, 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 in clans, families, and tribes. So, the, hetero, uh, the, the plural official and non-official normative orders would mold the understandings of rights among different Southeast Asians, such, as, such that one person's would likely be very different from the next. And so this first challenge of studying rights in Southeast Asia is connected to the second, which is the diverse interpretations, adaptations, and uses of rights. Put another way, uh, what do Southeast Asian people mean when they refer to rights? It can be quite an array of meanings because rights have multiple genealogies in the region. You can think about rights in terms of bills of constitutional rights in 11 states, an array of statutory rights provided by these states. There's also international rights treaties that some of these states governments have ratified. And of course, there's also different UN agencies, different NGOs, on, uh, embassies of global North governments that have tried to disseminate uh, international human rights discourses to different parts of Southeast Asia through the human rights programs and, and trainings. And of course, uh, this diverse source of uh, uh, diverse sources of rights become even more complicated when each individual try to articulate their claims in the language of rights. Uh, coming from different pos positionalities, they might harbor different ideas and different interests as well. So consequently, the third challenge is the plural and frequently inconsistent outcomes that flow from these diverse engagements by diverse peoples uh, with rights in Southeast Asia. In some cases, uh, the claims are triumphant. In some cases, uh, claimants for rights uh, lose out. The claims are rejected or uh, the advocacy is suppressed. Um, so with all these, uh, pulling together all these three challenges, um, I think that, and which is the motivation that I, uh, for writing a book on rights through the lenses of politics of rights when I proposed to the editors was that we need an approach that is capable of giving due consideration to all of these complexities uh, in the region. So that's why at the start of the talk, I said I would introduce uh, the, uh, this politics of rights as the analytical, entry point. So according to this approach, uh, briefly first, uh, rights are social practices whereby rights meanings and implications emerge from their mobilization, that is from being put into action. Uh, to answer questions about rights such as what do rights mean, what can rights accomplish, um, uh, someone using this framing would examine real life struggles over rights, how they are asserted, applied, tested, and contested. And the scholar would go about collecting, analyzing empirical data, or at the very least pay attention to the data analysis by others concerning the mobilization of rights to formulate answers to the, some of those questions that I raised uh, just now. So if you want to put it differently, the 
answers about rights do not lie in philosophy or abstract theorizing, uh, nor as many conventional legal scholars go about doing their research in evaluating the correctness of statutes, constitution documents, treaties, or judicial opinions. It is not that these, think, these ideas of thinking coming out from, from the legal documents or from philosophy or jurisprudence are not important, but, uh, but it is in the context of how research subjects might engage with these ideas. And if they do, they would become part of the data that we would examine um, rather than, uh, than the, the scholar going about examining the normative normativeness of, of these uh, ideas in, in jurisprudence or in uh, doctrine, uh, judicial opinion, and so on and so forth. And uh, so if you want to, another way to think about it is, it's the, 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 the politics of rights is also different from the liberal rights perspective which is that it doesn't go around trying to prescribe normatively rights as a political solution or propose how they can Im be improved in their application or contents. And it also can be contrasted with um, critical rights perspective of scholars where, uh, who are very skeptical about rights as a neoliberal oppressive force acting against governments and people of the global South, but rather, formulations and ideas about rights through the study of this framework, politics of rights, um, is informed by the empirical data before we make an evaluation, uh, which is something I'll get to at the end, toward the end uh, of the talk. In other words, uh, to find out the how, the what, and the why, uh, we need to go about Sorry, in, in, in other words, to understand rights, we need to go about finding out the how, the what, and the why before we are in a better position to theorize about the potential and limits of, of rights in order to formulate recommendations and criticisms. So, um, so that's the brief introduction uh, in relation to Southeast Asia and also briefly about politics of rights. Now let me go into the next section where I introduce specifically three concepts and features of politics of rights. I mentioned just now that this concept is actually based in American uh, study on law and society. Um, and oftentimes you will hear this concept of politics or rights uh, in the field of law and society as very much intertwined with another central concept, which is rights mobilization. So how do the two relate to each other? Well, politics or rights, I would say, is a social ph phenomenon that emerges from the processes of rights mobilization, where people who are claiming rights, their opponents and the supporters contend, collaborate, or otherwise interact with one another. So I think to understand, first of all, uh, politics of rights, we need to also engage with the concept of rights mobilization. And that is, um, for me, by drawing and synthesizing foundational and influential texts in that area of literature and also informed by my own work, I would say that rights mobilization are social practices by which individuals or a group of people make sense of and express their problems in the language of rights. In other words, it goes much broader than litigation or going to court. Uh, these people, individuals may be working separately on their own or they may be uh, co collaborating with each other. And in the process, they interpret and adapt rights to fend up attacks, push back restrictions, recruit losses, or fight for admission into institutions previously denied to them. And they could also use rights to empower other people to participate in their activities of uh, rights mobilization. So this is a main operating concept in politics of rights, uh, rights mobilization, that is. And um, I will now go on to introduce uh, three very pertinent characteristics of rights mobilization a bit briefly. One is the, the centering of law in the books. Two, interplay between structural and subjective conditions. And three, plural practices of rights. Again, uh, these are informed by a lot of literature in the social sciences, in law and society in particular, and also the literature on Southeast Asia and also my own work. Uh, so first of all, decentering law in the book. So for law and society scholars who study politics of rights, focusing on the processes of rights mobilization, uh, the, the classic 
or the uh, classic approach, I would say, is to decentralize law in the books. And that is to pay attention not only to official legal orders, but also to non-official normative orders when studying rights mobilization. And uh, in, in this manner, you are then able to account for the multiple uh, social orders and political orders, such as in a region uh, like uh, Southeast Asia. And so by doing so, a bigger cast of actors will also fall within the scope of uh, analysis instead of just judges, lawyers, or their opinions and their arguments. Although the principal cast, in other words, the principal cast will be much broader. For, they could include, as we can see in the Southeast Asian scholarship, student activists, uh, factory workers, uh, fisher folk, uh, peasants, migrants, refugees, and, and so on and so forth. So a uh, decentering law in the books is significant to all aspects of, of rights mobilization. And I'll come back uh, when I go, uh, and this will come back when we look at uh, the next uh, uh, sections that flow from here. So now moving on to the second feature of uh, rights mobilization, the interplay between structural and subjective conditions. And these are interactive processes between structural and subjective conditions. Uh, that's, sorry. Th th the, uh, this actually, this feature, the interactive processes between structure and subject, subjective conditions are actually the heartbeat of politics of rights. So the few uh, concepts here again, uh, I need to take you through them in order to get to the next few parts. So please bear with me. One is, uh, so what do we mean by structure here? This could refer to arrangements of people and their relationships at macro levels. Uh, the structural conditions can have normative force, which is often accompanied by sanctions and, it, and also uh, direct and pattern behavior. So what are some examples? The legal order of the state is one. Uh, the political order of the state is another, like how do you separate government and sub different branches, how to select, appoint office holders, and so on. Other uh, structures are not necessarily uh, totally about the state. Uh, there could be social structure. Uh, others are more hybrid, like gender. Gender is usually hybrid uh, as a structure composed of formal legal and political orders and non-official orders uh, that regulate who can count as male or female and how different genders of men and women, for instance, ought to behave. So that's one uh, sub-concept within this feature of rights mobilization. The other is subjective. And um, that refers to perceptions, decisions, actions, thoughts, emotions at the micro level of individual. So this actually concerns the ways in which people exercise agency, responding and construing, interpreting what the structural conditions are and then deciding how they would behave. And these considerations and these decisions are often based on their social position, their relationships and their past uh, uh, experiences. So, the interactions between subjective responses, between the subjective and the structure, so subjective responses to structures would make up uh, social uh, practices. And this is important to understanding rights as a uh, social practice. The structures alone do not uh, have mere force by, being, uh, by, mere, by their mere existence. They are only real if they continue to exert authority and have influence by being constantly put into action. It could be through formal enforcement, it could be through uh, sanctions, or it could be through the fact that people, when they think about their lives, think about their relationships, it's structure, it's they, they, their thinking and their, and their emotions are shaped by the way these structures or the structural conditions uh, help them to imagine these uh, arrangements. So it could, it's in the way that it helps them manifest their ideas or, or relationships. Uh, in that way, uh, you can say structures also uh, are made real through the, con the active uh, thinking and, and consciousness of people as well. So it doesn't necessarily have to be blatant action. So I, these are important because that means that the interplays, it is the interplay or the interaction between the structure and subjective uh, that, 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 is, that brings power or authoritarianism, something I'll get to, uh, to life. In other words, if you want to put it differently, structural conditions, even the worst ones, do not necessarily determine the emergence 
or the development of rights mobilization. Um, subjective conditions, how people exercise agency in relation to the former are important as well. As I look at Southeast Asia, I'm reminded that time after time, local populations have risen up in defiance of extremely dangerous and hostile conditions, such as the very memorable uprisings in 1988, 2008, and uh, two years ago in Myanmar against military rule. And of course, there was the 1988 people power movement against the Marcos regime of the Philippines, uh, just to name a few examples. So now let me move on to the third feature of rights mobilization, and that is uh, plural practices of rights. I think this has come up a few times uh, before in my in my uh, in, in my talk. Now the first two features, decentering law in the books and the interplay between subjective and structural conditions, actually lead us to this third feature, the plurality uh, of rights practices, because of uh, the the diverse people with different subjective or structure, or, or, and, and or structural conditions, um, with, through these uh, ongoing interactions, they are going to enact disparate social practices um, as they engage with these structural conditions unevenly and uh, unequally. And so that also then suggests to us that the plurality of rights um, and the meanings of rights are malleable and contingent. Now here in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over, but that's a question that I would raise and I do answer in the book. And that is, I think is an important quandary that has, uh, that is in the politics of rights scholarship. Uh, maybe something we can talk about later is if anyone can uh, interpret rights differently, engage with rights differently, it would mean, first of all, the weak and the marginalized can adapt and reinvent the meanings of rights. But at the same time, so can the elite and the powerful. Then in, then in other words, is there any normative constraint to the way we uh, treat uh, mobilization of rights? Do we also consider uh, the mobilization of rights by the elite, the powerful and the oppressive as also part of the study of politics of rights? So I offer, as I said, I offer uh, some thoughts about this. We push the empirical nature of studying rights in this framework to its, uh, to its very end. Uh, so I'd like to open that for this uh, discussion later on. But in the interest of time, let me then um, now move on to talk about the next three sections. So having introduced to you the above three features of rights mobilization, I now am gonna talk about the three questions. This first one is about the emerge, how do rights uh, mobilization emerge and how does that relate to structural conditions? Uh, the second is how do we understand the broader array of rights practices in Southeast Asia? And the third uh, section is about how we analyze the impact of rights through the lenses of this framing. So first, as you recall, the question is what are the structural conditions that influence the emergence of rights mobilization. I think we first need to locate what I call sites of authoritarianism or authoritarian power. And we also need to recognize how authoritarianism exerts itself through social practices. Um, so here, let me first introduce to you um, what I mean by plural sites of authoritarianism. It's only by understanding that sites of, authorit uh, of authoritarianism are plural and that there are different forms of social controls that we can understand why there's uh, different types of practices or rights uh, and such diversity in the region like Southeast Asia. So now what do I mean by plural, uh, plural sites of authoritarianism? When we think of authoritarianism, we often come up with a list of states. This or that state in Southeast Asia or in another part of the world are authoritarian. Um, you can perhaps name Myanmar, you can perhaps name China and so on and so forth. Um, but in, in, a, in an earlier piece, I said that while this is one way to think about it, um, is another way to think about authoritarianism that does not mean that we have to always associate this concept with states and their former structures. Instead, 
in that earlier article, I urged social legal scholars to focus on the essence of authoritarianism, which is power that perpetuates the domination of an individual or group over social relations and protects the dominant individual or groups accompanying privileges and interests. So if we see in this way, going back to, to this essence that I propose, then authoritarianism emanates from and can reside in multiple sites. And this is a perspective that resonates with uh, classic social legal texts and also broader theories in the, in, in the social uh, sciences. So then therefore authoritarian sites can include the state, can be found in religious communities, in tribes, in corporations, in gangs, in families, and in clans. And one site can consist of one or more normative orders that make up these uh, forms of authoritarianism that can also overlap to generate interrelated effects of authoritarianism. Um, let me give you an example. At the state level, um, overall, one might say, oh, this looks like a state that's democratic, it doesn't look very authoritarian, but there may be pockets or enclaves as some political scientists have called it, enclaves of authoritarianism within the state. For instance, uh, the uh, racist authoritarian enclaves that was found in uh, uh, apartheid South Africa or the Southern states of the United States. And you can also find this in the ways in which different states in Southeast Asia manage uh, racial or religious or ethnic minorities uh, as well. So that's one idea that I wanted to put forth to understand how the structural conditions shape uh, the emergence of rights mobilization. Now, the second uh, that I want to talk, second feature that I want to talk about within this section is social controls. Um, social controls are a form of social practice. Just now earlier, I talked about social practices, this uh, phenomena that emerges from subjective uh, 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 interactions, engagements with structural conditions and social, social controls are one form of social practice. They are the kinds that realize and bring to life authoritarianism. And just like the way rights practices are the, are, are the are social practices that bring rights to life and resist authoritarianism. Now uh, here primarily, I just wanted to highlight uh, three, a couple of features about social controls. So you can imagine social controls as being uh, on a spectrum from the ones that are very blatant that we can recognize, uh, identify very easily to more subtle, more elusive forms of social controls and, and the impact could be cumulative. What is uh, very visible blatant forms of social controls could over time also accumulate to have elusive, less visible, more subtle forms into uh, impact. So let me give a few examples to, to, to illustrate this. Um, social controls can, uh, can appear in the most uh, uh, blatant, visible ones, like physical things, like barriers, weapons, handcuffs, or there could be in written or spoken language, like legal restrictions, like threats, or in the forms of actions like killing, uh, prosecuting or shouting at someone. Now, at first glance, you would say, oh, maybe, well, that looks like what we see in structures, right? Um, but yes, however, the linchpin is social practice. The, the, the uh, authoritarian nature of a structure comes to life only if people engage and believe or believe in these, uh, in these ideas or enforce these social controls. So that would be one example, the most blatant and more easily detectable forms of, of social controls. They could like uh, blatant violence, laws and threats and so on and so forth. Um, another kind of, uh, if we move more in the, into the middle of the spectrum, we may locate less overt, but still somewhat um, obvious uh, uh, modes of control. So now in this sort of central region, these could be laws that actually seem rather innocuous or neutral, or they may even seem to be helpful to the marginalized individuals and groups. For instance, allowing you to register your activist uh, organization, allowing you to have some space to speak out, 
or voice your, or your dissent or allowing you, you know, that courts granting you standing or leave to um, go to court and fight a case. In a way, uh, while these are, they seem to be helpful, but at the same time, they're also constraining and channeling where uh, objections, protests, or dissent can take place such that if you, if you go out of this physical or discursive space, um, you will be disciplined or sanctioned. And so that is a more subtle way, but not entirely uh, invisible form of social control. And if you get to, from this middle spectrum, portion of the spectrum, you get to the end, other end of it, you might encounter increasingly el elusive modes of control. This could be what uh, some scholars have called um, controls that shape the way you believe certain ways of life, uh, certain ways of feeling and thinking are normal and natural and others uh, ought to be disciplined or sanctioned, um, such that you know, some people might succumb to feelings of guilt uh, and so on and so forth to in the whole backs uh, uh, and their behavior or conduct and try to conform to the authority and structures, uh, prefer ideas, actions of ways of life. So um, taken together, I would say that these, the ways in which uh, we understand pluricides of authoritarianism and how different forms of social controls manifest or bring to life authoritarianism. That gives us a better background to understanding the next point, which I wanted to make, want to make, which is on the plural practices of rights. Why is it that we see in Southeast Asia different forms of engagements? And the same, and also I should say, it is through this lens that we can expand our scope and realize that actually mobilization of rights is more than just protesting on the streets, uh, claiming a rights violation or going to court to litigate what is perceived as a rights violation. So here in this uh, section, I'm gonna talk about the second question, which is how do people mobilize rights and in what forms do can right, rights mobilization take? Um, very briefly, I would say, first of all, in Southeast Asia, this is a very broad repertoire, at least in the way I have framed it. And uh, I framed it and organized this expansive repertoire of rights practices in Southeast Asia. I would say arguably other places where you can find pluricides of authoritarianism and different types of social controls um, based on three characteristics, the degree of coordination of the tactic, the degree of openness of the tactic and the degree of its formality. Degree of coordination refers to whether the practice was carried out individually or collectively and in a more orchestrated fashion. A degree of openness refers to whether the mobilizer has concealed from the uh, people from positions of authority and power the intention to challenge their power. It's not that the action is, is hidden or open, it's rather the intention is hidden or open or, 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 or visible. Uh, third, degree of formality uh, refers to whether uh, the mobilizer is using formal or, or, or official channels of the state, using more quasi-formal methods like consulting lawyers, or formal means like um, um, going to court um, or petitioning uh, the legislature and so on and so forth. So let me briefly and so you can think about these three, uh, the uh, degree of co coordination, formality, and openness as three intersecting axes in a three-dimensional uh, space um, and uh, where you would plot a particular type of, of tactic um, would be based on where, the, where it lands on those uh, on the three uh, axes. So let me give some examples of, of these four kinds of um, rights mobilization tactics within this broad repertoire in this three-dimensional space. Uh, first, uh, uncoordinated, hidden, and mostly informal. Now, the most uh, famous kind of characterization would be by James C. Scott, uh, who wrote about uh, Malay peasants in Peninsula Malaysia. And he called their uncoordinated hidden tactics like foot dragging, desertion, false compliance, slander, sabotage, against their landowners as uh, everyday resistance. So on the surface, they might seem to be following uh, and complying with these social controls, but really they 
hide their resistant uh, uh, intention in order to uh, gain some, uh, a little bit of advantage without the knowledge um, of their, uh, of the people in positions of in power. Those are usually the landowners. And in Southeast Asia, it's not only in the Malay village that uh, James uh, Scott found, um, this kind of tactic, given the odds of authoritarian stack against them, can be found among peasants in other contexts, uh, among factory workers, other kinds of laborers, uh, ethnic minorities, uh, and so on and so forth. I found this, all these many examples in the literature. Now, of course, the key to detecting since the, the intention is hidden is in the empirical work. What's the resistor's intention really, uh, does it really embody an interpretation and expression and understanding of their discontent in rights terms or were they only thinking of, maybe I just want to undercut someone and trying to take some kind of advantage. Did the peasant, in other words, believe they had a right or thought their right had been violated when they were carrying out these sort of hidden practices? So that's a little bit hard to detect, I admit, but I think that is not, that is an empirical challenge uh, rather than, uh, I would rather say that's an empirical challenge and dismiss it uh, totally as being uh, theoretically infeasible. The second category would be coordinated, hidden, and mostly non-formal. So the only difference between this and the everyday resistance, the first one, uncoordinated, hidden, mostly non-formal, is that this one, actually doesn't, uh, it involves more than one individual because it's coordinated. Um, but as, but their, their, in, their resisted intention and their tactics are off, uh, the resistant intention is actually often hidden and mostly uh, the tactics are non-formal. So let me give you the example from my uh, earlier study on the gay rights movement in Singapore. They performed this kind of coordinated hidden practice that I call pragmatic uh, resistance. Uh, so an example is uh, they organized an annual uh, uh, LGBT rally in the only spot in Singapore where people can gather without requiring in advance a, a, a public assembly license. So on the surface, they are basically out there uh, to bring people together to show support for a marginalized and uh, minority community, but the, but their intent, they, but they did not expose their resistant intent, or rather, it's a little bit more hidden. They are not calling for the state, at least in the earliest part of the movement, not challenging uh, the state's boundaries or, or the state's criminalization at the time of uh, same-sex behavior and. Also, at the same time, they are not challenging the state's boundaries on public demonstrations. They are, they are staying within, legally within the, the, uh, the permitted space. But inwardly, they know they are resisting the restriction. By doing that, they are intentionally trying to push the boundaries of the right to assembly to hold a public gay rally uh, in the state that had, at the time criminalized uh, same-sex conduct, uh, sexual conduct. So that is one example of the, un uh, the coordinated, hidden, and non-formal. Uh, a third, uh, in the third category, would be going back to uncoordinated, uh, but the resistant attention is open and uh, the tactics could be arranged, formal to non-formal. And this is where I take the cue from uh, people, st scholars who study Chinese peasants. They have called this kind of, of mobilization rightful resistance. So these people, to quote O'Brien Lee, they draw upon laws and policies and other officially promoted values to defy disloyal uh, political and economic elites. And, and they make use of, quote, influential allies and recognized principles to apply pressure on those in power who have failed to live up to a professed ideal or who have not implemented some beneficial measure. So let me give an example from uh, the Vietnamese context. Uh, du Phong Nguyen has done a study of Vietnamese labor rights. And she found a form of right for resistance in the ways in which they protest their uh, unfair treatment. So some of these factory workers wrote letters to the labor inspector of the state to complain about illegal conduct by the employers. And in this process, in their writing, they say that the government has to be 
the local government, and they're writing to uh, the central government, has to hold the, the local government has to be held accountable for the plight. And they also refer to labor rights legislation that they say that local officials have not enforced. And they also refer to the Communist Party's representation itself of itself as a vanguard of equality and progress. So this is one example of rightful resistance. Uh, these are individuals, so it's uncoordinated, but it's very open, they're openly challenging the state. And their method in this case of letter writing, I would say is a form of formal tactic because they actually, um, they did not go through a formal forum, but they wrote uh, a formal letter to an official uh, actor. Now, the fourth example, that I, uh, the fourth category would be coordinated, open, and a range of tactics that would be formal to non-formal. Let me just give you a two examples that are very uh, common. The first would be a formal tactic, uh, collective uh, legal campaigns uh, to, let's say, uh, challenge for more equal, equal rights for women, for sexual or uh, gender minorities. So the tactic often involves uh, non-government uh, organizations or certain uh, activist groups working together with lawyers. It's open, it's obviously going to court, openly challenging uh, the legality uh, of uh, 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 the legal order of the state. And the tactic is formal, you know, litigating, going to uh, the, the, the court. As for an example of one that's non-formal would be a uh, very coordinated large scale protests that you sometimes see bursting out on the streets. Um, I would say, you know, Burmese activists who in in couple, in, since 2021 that protested on the streets, this would be a form of very open coordinated but non-formal form of rights mobilization in which they call for their political rights or the human rights to be recognized and, and protected. Uh, so I think my time is running out, but I will now go on to move, go on to talk about the third question, which is what are the consequences of rights mobilization and how do we assess them? So given these uh, plural sites of authoritarianism, given these uh, different forms of social controls from the obvious to the elusive that have uh, germinated different kinds of subjective, uh, and, uh, subjective interplay with, with uh, structural conditions, generating plural types of rights practices, a broad repertoire, uh, and I've just introduced to you and organized them for you uh, in four uh, different uh, categories. So what can we then say about the outcomes of rights mobilization, given these varieties of practices uh, that we see? I think, if we are to take a look at the Southeast Asian region, and perhaps in many other regions of the world, you say that probably is a mix of gains and a mix of perhaps losses or areas that attract uh, criticisms. In terms of gains, there are instrumental gains. That means that uh, the, the, the rights mobilization has succeeded perhaps in, in gaining more rights uh, legislation or in enforcing existing rights legislation to successfully compel behavior in one way or another to provide more improved security or, or quality of life. For instance, uh, enhancing the right of minority populations to right to a right to education, improving uh, uh, the uh, legislation to protect women uh, from abuse, and so on and so forth. Um, and another kind of success would be the less visible type that we call cultural effects or cultural transformation, changing the way an individual feel that, that about themselves as someone who is entitled to equal protection and dignity in, in, in their social relationships and their relationship uh, with the state. And even though this is a, at a, it's often at a very personal individual level, I would say that these individual level types of cultural transformations can have broader ram ramifications as well. In my own research, Burmese LGBT people who became exposed to and engaged with the LGBT rights movement transformed themselves individually, but they went on uh, to feel empowered and wanted to join the movement 
and become activists themselves and then uh, participate in the activities of the movement that try to uh, do good or achieve more for a marginalized population. So you can see from, from their personal level, cultural transformations can induce uh, broader transformations uh, as well. Now, in terms of drawbacks and criticisms, again, from the instrumental point of view, you can say that, well, you just look around any place, uh, Southeast Asia, in Latin America or in Africa and so on and so forth, um, there are a lot of instrumental setbacks of rights mobilization as well. Uh, rights legislation, even though they're put in place, they may not be enforced properly, or then maybe later on uh, overturned. Or people who actually uh, mobilize for rights or fight for rights in the courts may face intense uh, retaliation or opposition from the state or other uh, uh, social groups in their uh, community. And there are also scholars, like scholars from uh, who adopt a more critical perspective of rights. They would worry that so much reliance on rights to achieve protection, to protect the dignity of, of local populations could end up um, reinforcing uh, unequal social structure in their state and also reinforcing the in, in inequality of uh, resources and flows of knowledge between the global north and the south based on the uh, assumption that you know ideas of international human rights flow from the north uh, uh, to the south so there are these different critiques around it and so i see lo a little bit more about that in the volume itself but here i want to just conclude with a few points for us to think about how do we get out of this thorny debate uh, for and against rights. And I want to come back to the, the feature of pol politics of rights uh, that I began with. And that is there are the presence of state and non-state sites of authoritarianism with multiple normative orders in Southeast Asia. Uh, there's the ever contingent interplay between structural and subjective conditions. And consequently, there are plural practices of rights that form a broad and diverse repertoire. And importantly, we need to, we need to remember that politics of rights is, is, is a very empirically grounded approach. So a few things with these points in mind to think about. Um, in Southeast Asia, at least from my observation is, and my studies, is that rights are not uh, uh, only one of many practices to which people in Southeast Asia turn to to deal with their problems. And sometimes um, they may not turn to rights. They may seek, they may use rights in combination with uh, other normative orders and they repackage rights, reinterpret rights into something that is more locally resonant and, 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 and uh, pliable. And so, I think this idea that rights is always might have this danger or hazard of becoming uh, or uh, occluding other forms of thinking and doing may need to be empirically tested and borne out in every context. And also, if you look around in Southeast Asia, the, the very fact that you have mixed outcomes of rights mobilization, rights often fail. It just shows that you know this danger has not come to fruition. As rights have not materialize yet into a hegemonic uh, structure. And the second point is that, you know, it's important to also think about why do people on the ground turn to rights is because oftentimes they are trying to find alternatives to, and to counter entrench norms in their very own culture or norms that are often held up as their culture. And in other words, rights is a form of resource for an outside alternative for them. And you want to borrow from uh, E.P. Thompson's uh, conclusion about legal power in the Black Act in 18th century England, rights sometimes can actually change lives for the better and address suffering under authoritarianism. And this, is, this awaits some empirical investigation and uh, assessment. And the third point I want to point out is, um, what is moderate at one place or at a particular time can be threatening to an established order at another time? In other words, in places where rights have not become part of an accepted way of thinking or doing, rights can be very powerful. And that is why some uh, uh, local activists have tried to use it to change 
their social circumstances or their social relations and their relationship uh, with the state. Otherwise, and if rights were not threatening in many states in the region, then why would some states go about questioning very, very violently uh, assertions or cause for rights that we can see uh, in the region? For instance, most recently in the uh, uprising against uh, military dictatorship in Myanmar. So in other words, I want to come back to this in closing to, to come back to the empirical nature of the politics of rights and say, before we can make an assessment about the pros and cons, uh, we need to be very attentive to these uh, pluralities on the ground and uh, find out the how, and what happens and the why. Um, I'm gonna stop here so that we have a little bit more time for a discussion. I'm happy to elaborate more on some of the points that I had to uh, uh, skip over. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Lynette. That was a really rich, stimulating, fascinating presentation. Um, I wanted just to note before I hand over to Srila that, you know, the points you raised about um, authoritarianism. And I think it's important that we are attuned to, uh, you know, those debates and those questions, uh, given that across the sort of Asia, Asia, Africa axis, if you will, autocratization, it's such a defining tendency. Uh, of politics uh, and of states, uh, and of course, as uh, as you know, everyone in this room will be attuned to. It very often revolves around whether it's uh, you know uh, by downright totalitarian states or by, in principle, democratic states. It involves encroachments upon minority rights, very often in the pro as a as a means to to define the ominous other that the nation must be defended against, the ominous other that a people, whether it's in the Indian context, um, a Hindu people uh, that must be the protected against a Muslim threat or in uh, the Ugandan context, the, uh, you know, uh, an African people that must be uh, defended against uh, the threat that's constituted by queer sexuality, you know, that those processes really span our regions and it raises a lot of questions. One of which for me is how we think strategically about the uses of rights. And I think you touched upon that towards the end, you know, it's very easy to to develop sort of academic and scholarly critiques uh, of liberal rights uh, principles, uh, but in the context that we are now, uh, it often seems very urgent to protect that, which we were very keen to criticize, you know, when when the context was slightly different. Certainly, that's something that I confront in the context of researching politics uh, in India at the moment. So, so one question there is, of course, how do we think about this strategically, uh, the urgency of protecting even sort of basic uh, constitutional secular uh, civil rights? Um, and then the wider question of how far does that take you? You know, uh, what about those debates that we used to have? How do we reach beyond it? Can we keep both things in mind as we think strategy around rights? Um, but I'm not going to arrogate more time to myself. I just wanted to note it because I thought it was so striking in what you said. Uh, and perhaps you can come back to it. But I'll, uh, Lynette, but I'll hand over to Srila for, for her comments uh, as well. And then that will take it from there, I think. Yes. So Srila, it's over to you. Um, yeah, thanks, Alf, and thanks so much, Lynette. I mean, obviously, you know, there's there's lot to. Uh, I mean, there, there are a lot of like different ways in which we could take this, and that's what's so I think generative about the book. And for people who don't know, and Alf, maybe you can share a, a link. It's it's um, it's part of the Elements uh, series by is it Cambridge? Yes. So yeah. what I'll do. Well, they used to have have it free for download. Now it's not. If you are able to purchase ah. it, great. But you can also drop an email. I'd be happy to provide <laughs> an e-copy. Yeah. So I'm gonna, uh, as you talk, I'm gonna provide the link in the chat. Uh, chat. Oh well, I mean, it's I'm already sorry. there. Actually, already done it. But yeah, if there's any, um, you know, access. Um, uh, the entry points that you want to introduce and just share here, that's great. But just to say to people who don't know, it's 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 really a short. I mean, how many how many pages is it? It's it's almost like a, a manifesto, I would say, and that really just covers, you know, everything that I mean for people who know, but people who don't know, it's very concise and, 
and easy for, I mean, I would use it for teaching purposes or just even as a, as a way of consolidating so many different things that a lot of us have read over the years, but it's all in one place. Yeah, how many words is it again? Just remind me, I mean, how many uh, words It's only 24,000 for, for this volume. Uh, for this series, they yeah. limit it to 30,000 maximum. Yeah, so that's exactly the idea. It's yes. it's supposed to to introduce a field or a region. Yes. Um, but anyway, but to go back a bit because also for you know people who haven't read your earlier work, and I always found that really useful for for my own work, like looking at that kind of very textured, uh, nitty gritty way in which um, particularly LGBT activists in places like. Um, Singapore, Burma, you've done some comparative work in China, you know, how all of, I mean, how that that work is actually done, right? And I think that's what you were, one of the points that you mentioned today about the structural conditions that shape rights uh, mobilization. So I was just thinking, and I, I mean, obviously you mentioned, you have, and that's what, also what's very useful, I think, about the current work, like there are a lot of examples, but it, rem it took me back to the, the earlier work where you know, you you talk about how lesbian activists are aligning with women's rights activists, and of course, using discourses around violence against women or domestic violence in various strategic ways, or of course, HIV AIDS, and I, and and that always spoke directly to my own work when I saw how, uh, you know, queer feminist activists in India would also strategically uh, change and ally with different kinds of, um, you know, uh, dis discursive frames, but also um uh, potential regimes for resources and capital accumulation ex uh, especially in a context of of criminalization right so you know the choices and we forget this in terms of ngo work and and organized activism work right like these structural conditions and i think again your own ethnography but also the current book shows us how those structural conditions change and are constantly you know reshaping the horizons of possibility for uh, you know, activists to make claims to the state, right, in ways that both expand but also uh, constrain. So, um, so yeah, so that's just my way of saying that I've just found that kind of, you know, the concretization of uh, what what we think of in terms of rights cultures really useful. Uh, and I think Alp's work does that too in the context of, of India. But I suppose with that, uh, I mean, from that, I, I, I think one of the things I was uh, thinking about, and you mentioned it uh, uh, here, and also I think briefly in the in the book, which is the the normative, right? And I feel like with uh, discussions about rights, like the 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 normative aspect is 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 always about how it's 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 Western, it's liberal, it's Eurocentric. And um, and and there have been you know variations um, of those arguments, right? One which is of course the classic: uh, they are Western liberal and they don't translate onto our context. And you know, there I think particularly if you're a feminist uh, scholar or a scholar looking at gender rights or sexual rights, it's been important. The burden has been on us in a sense to push back and say, well, actually. <laughs> Some of these rights have been quite, you know, important for us to, to to talk back to local patriarchies, right? Notwithstanding if they're Western or liberal. But another, I think, a different, um, uh, you know, uh, iteration of the same logic is to say, right? They're just derivative, right? So they originate somewhere else, and then they just land on our context. And do they, um, you know, do they really travel or not? And actually. And particularly, I think this is a lot of, uh, again, work in the context of nonprofits and NGOs, which is that, you know, actually that work just shows the limits of rights frameworks and that they don't travel. And, you know, if you think of, and again, like you would know, and I think a lot of, I mean, everyone else who's joining would know, you know, like categories like, uh, which which became mainstream during the HIV AIDS pandemic glo uh, globally, like men who have sex with men. Uh, I think that's the classic way of showing how, you know, certain population groups at risk became claimants of rights, but at the same time, how that category foreclosed certain ways of thinking about um, a gender difference and sexual orientation practices, right? Those practices just collapsed into these very narrow, rigid 
um, categories of biopolitics and governmentality, right? So, um, but the third, I think more perhaps, I mean, I actually must confess, I haven't read the book and maybe you haven't, I know Alf has engaged with Sumi's work a lot more, which is Sumi Madhok's recent work on vernacular rights culture, where I think the provocation is to say, is, is to try and move away from this kind of global local, you know, origin and, and, and um, imitation to say, well, actually, uh, you know, the, the West has no uh, kind of prior, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, hegemony on rights. Like there are rights cultures everywhere in the rest of the world. It's just that we, ha those have maybe not traveled. So if we decolonize human rights, then we can start to think of and take those rights cultures seriously. Alf, would you say that's a, that's that's like a sort of okay summary. I mean, I don't know, Lynette, maybe you've read the work, so, and, uh, but I just, yeah, I just thought that's an interesting way, uh, and certainly that's how the book is being received as a way of really moving forward uh, this, this kind of tired argument, right, about uh, human rights and whether they're global and whether they're local and the role of culture. So in any case, that's like one of the things I was curious about uh, what you think about. I, I, I don't know if it's quite intentional on your part to actually not dwell too much on the culture question in the current book, at least, because maybe it is just boring, you know, for, especially in, in our context, always have to say, oh, are they Western? Are they universal or not? Right. Um, so alongside that, I mean, actually, it, relatedly, I'm, I've always been very impressed by how much of a comparative comparativist you are and how much you know you actually bring all these regions in conversation even though you know one could say they are all in southeast asia but they're quite they're obviously quite distinct right and i just i i find that quite daunting but also um uh, interesting and i just thought as i mean this is maybe a more methodological question but as someone who does this kind of comparative work how do you think it um maybe takes us away from um, comparison becoming a colonial modality and falling into kind of area studies, you know? So how do we, I suppose my question is, and this is really <laughs> for myself, how do we do comparative work without, you know, without reinforcing an area, a colonial area studies logic, right? Um, I, and I think just very, um, Finally, um, as you know, Alf said, and other people in the audience. I mean, it's it's a pity we've just lost uh, Debelina Day, who I saw was here, uh, because we. I mean, Debelina is a, a a scholar from. She's a legal scholar. I mean, I know she's she or they are located in India, and they probably are a legal scholar or sociologist of law and. As I was saying to you at the start, Lynette, uh, India is having these proceedings at the moment. It's day five for marriage equality in the Supreme Court, which is India's highest court. So that's like one really interesting site, which is uh, unfolding as we speak. And the other one, which you know, people like Ephemia, who's in the audience, uh, can speak to is what's happened in Uganda with the, uh, you know, I mean, basically really, Wretching up laws against uh, and further intensify intense intensely criminalizing homosexuality and which has been again directly linked. I mean, in I suppose in both contexts, it's interesting how the transnational has played a ma major role. So in Uganda, there's a direct link with you know evangelical groups uh, and uh, who are providing funds to to African governments from the U.S. Uh, in the Indian context. There have been moments in the proceedings where, uh, you know, other countries in the north have been evoked to say, well, once you've decriminalized homosexuality, how can you not have marriage equality? Because that's what's in the U.S. So I, it's quite interesting how, whether at a discursive level or in a very tangible material level, you know, the transnational uh, comes to play. And, and not just in terms of the the North and the South, but also within the South. So um, just very recently, I was speaking to uh, my colleague from WITS, who's a, a trans scholar, and I was talking about these, the, the, the judgment, the, the 
uh, a debate in India right now. And and they were actually really anxious about this argument of saying, well, decriminalization of homosexuality means marriage rights. Because they said if that actually came to the African continent, immediately people would be like, absolutely do not decriminalize homosexuality because the next thing there'll be marriage and family, you know. So anyway, so it's just, I think that's that's just very interesting. And it's also interesting for me to think about, again, and, and I, as someone who, you know, works across different contexts, how we think of the ways, you know, rights language travels or or not. And, and FME actually has written a piece recently on Uganda on how, you know, again, rights discourses narrow the frame. So, I mean, these are not really, I don't think these are questions, but it's just what I, I mean, I'd be very curious to hear what you, what you think, but obviously feel free to take um, the conversation, whatever direction. And, and thank you so much. I mean, I think we've all learned a lot. Yeah, thanks, Rila, so much. Uh, we're handing over to Lynette for responses and, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, generous and extensive comments. I, I hope to have some time to hear from other audience members. So I think I will pick uh, two or three points from your uh, comments uh, to, to respond to. Um, one is the, the, the point about how this is in some ways comparative, even though it is only about uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, I'm actually quite, uh, it's a pleasant surprise to hear you say that, but when I think about it, actually, you're right. Um, the, the comparison for me is tacit. That means that I'm, in, because of, of the politics of rights, uh, theoretical framing having its American origins, um, it is a, a, a implied conversation with people who work in the North American context, but because of the nature of the volume and because I'm also an empirically grounded scholar, I, I haven't done any work in North America, so I'm not gonna do an explicit comparison, but there is that conversation tacitly uh, going at that theoretical level and also at the in, empirical level. And uh, of course, in writing this volume, I was also thinking about how it is not the only region, I mentioned it a few times throughout, it's not the only region that is plural and diverse. You can think of other continents that have these sort of similar, uh, you can use similar descriptions for that. Of course, the contextual specifics will, will be will differ, but you can also say, you know, this re the region that you are working in are diverse, plural, and so on and so forth. So that's also the, the, the tacit comparison that I hope to generate. Um, but I do that, I don't do that upfront. I, in fact, uh, it's a pleasant surprise because you know from my earlier work, I've not done anything really explicitly compared to the ones that I worked on on China. It was with a scholar who had done work on China. That's not my data. Um, but that's how I would respond. Uh, and I think that oftentimes when we, especially when we do grounded kind of research, one context alone is in itself quite daunting and can have that, that kind, to produce that kind of rich understanding about rights and you're thinking, oh my goodness, gonna multiply this by two or three is actually quite daunting. And, and so we often end up doing very rich case studies. And, and then they think, oh, this is only an area study, or even a country study. So going on to the other point, and how does it have relevance, right, to the larger conversations around this theory or that theory? Um, but I think for the for for myself at least, um, trying to stay grounded in the data, I always try to relate that to larger theoretical implications, such as you know what does it mean for human rights in the in the context of of Myanmar or for social movements in less in non-Western uh, democracies in the case of my other case of Singapore. And again, have in my mind that tacit conversation instead of trying to you know, explicitly, because that tends to draw a lot of criticisms uh, because you haven't done that explicit comparison in the other state. But I hope that through these sort of engagements with the larger theoretical conversations, it can inspire uh, people to think about how this frame, framework differs from or can be refined in their research context. Like the stuff that I've done on Singapore and pragmatic resistance, over the years, I've heard from uh, scholars working on China coming to tell me that it's actually relevant, highly relevant to help 
them think about activism over there. And I never explicitly mentioned China in my work and say, I'm hoping that this will generate conversation or whatever, but it was something that I had been thinking about that I'm reminded of this, but I, I, I think I, I do that in this more in, 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 uh, indirect uh, manner. And I will say that I would not be writing this short volume had I not done a lot of empirical work myself to, to, to generate the studies on politics. Right? It's a very synthetic piece of writing, you know, 24,000 words, nothing in original data about drawing from previous work or other people's work. But a bit ironic in the sense that you're talking about you have to study this empirically. But I have to say, this is, of course, uh, based on many years of cum cumulative uh, uh, ideas having uh, done the work on, on the ground. So, and let me, and so that's one thing I want to address. The other is you asked me about the so-called culture question, right? The, I, I, I did not quite uh, directly address the question whether rights are Western or not. Um, not directly, but I think the answer can be found in in the uh, in the in the in the discussion about how rights are multiple genealogies in the region, right? They can be found in these cons constitutional bill of rights. They may have may or may not have uh, uh, Western or global northern uh, influence. They can also be found in uh, religions and local social order. So I think that's sort of my indirect way of providing the answer rather than say, this is West or East. It is. It depends on how you trace the genealogy and what kind of resources people tap onto to frame their own ideas about rights. So that's how I, I would address that. So there's about seven minutes left. I would rather hear from other people if there are questions. Yeah, any questions uh, for, um, for Lynette? You can put your hand up, um, turn on your camera if you want. All right, there is a question there in the chat box. Lynette, can you see that? Should I read it out? Um, so it's from FMEA and it goes like this. In Ghana, I've noticed that NGOs there spend a lot of time quelling the fears of the public that LGBTQ Ghanaians want marriage equality. Their strategy is to diminish what they're asking for uh, to seem less threatening to the established order. What do you think of that strategy? And are there only any other rights compromises or rights narrowing that similar groups in Southeast Asia also engage in? That's the question. Um, so, and do you want to tackle that? Uh, let me let me just digest this a little bit. Uh, it's not a familiar context uh, for yeah. me. But I, I, I get the general idea that uh, to get that little bit, they have it's a compromise. In other yeah. words, um, yeah. So I'm racking my brains to think of it. Of, well, of, I mean, can I just say I like the I like the coinage of rights compromises because it's also uh, it, it resonates with your kind of pragmatic resistance, right? And 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 in a way, we could all agree that all of this is a terrain of you know of push and pull. But at some level, you're maybe I don't know um, if I mean FMA is obviously asking for maybe resonances in that context. But then the question is, is that just push and pull enough? Okay, FMA, you can just. Speak no. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Hi, sorry, I am. I can actually speak. I just thought maybe I could clarify a bit. Um, so in a lot of the spaces that I spend in talking with um, Af Africanists, um, activists across Africa, a lot of our discussions seem to boil down to what is the best way to achieve freedom. So you have the argument that strategic litigation has worked. It's worked in Botswana, um, South Africa, it's worked there. But you also have places like Kenya, which had hashtag repeal um, 162, which was their particular British penal code that um, was used um, to um, promulgate repression against LGBT communities. And that um, the repealing failed. They weren't able to repeal the law. And um, there was also increased backlash and increased violence during that time. Um, and so I kind of wonder about the different strategies, different LGBT communities within countries use, and also the contextations within those own communities. Um, and I was just interested in the Southeast Asian context, what the kind of discussions were about that, 
and also were similar compromises being made or um, were groups more united, that kind of thing. Thanks, okay. Afmi. Oh. I, I, I will share um, it, an example that took place only recently. Um, this in, in Singapore, obviously many years after I done my research, uh, Singapore in December, was it November last year, decriminalized consensual same-sex conduct. And in that, on the same, at the same time, uh, the government also um, amended the constitution to say that the, uh, the uh, government institution that can put a definition or define marriage is the legislature. In other words, um, this is uh, to say that in the future, if there's any struggle or any uh, disagreement over marriage being between a man and a woman, the deciding body would be the legislature and, uh, and, the, and the other forum that often people may look to will be the courts. So even though you know, I haven't done extensive research on this, uh, my understanding is this, this is a way for the state to try to deal with different uh, social groups, the conservative religious groups and the LGBT groups that are hoping to achieve some kind of, of legal change. And they got it after so many years, they got decriminalization. Uh, but uh, the signal that the state sent was also that um, marriage may, may not be uh, as fast or may not be something that's immediately, at least not immediately, on the table. So I do not know, um, not having done the research in re these recent times, what the sort of, sort of conversations were behind the scene, but as an observer, this would be uh, a form of a political compromise. And this is all quite public. You can see this in the speeches that the government officials have put out and so on and so forth. So that would be uh, something that I can think of uh, as, an, as an example uh, of that. But at the same time, I will also say in uh, another example I can come up with is what some scholars in the US context call it the radical flanked effect. In the, in the uh, 60s, uh, the, the uh, uh, Black Civil Rights Movement and the Black Power Movement, often the idea is, you know, the, the rights activists come into the room and say, do you want to talk to us, the Martin Luther Kings, or you want to talk to the black radical activist Malcolm X outside. So in the sense that is an example of a compromise that people in some context, uh, the power holders see rights activists as perhaps a little bit more manageable or something, someone they can have a conversation with versus the more leftist and more radical uh, 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 um, opponents. And therefore I don't see this as unique to, you know, the, the context that you're working in. It's also I can find many examples in the in, in the studies that come out about social movements in in North America as well. And at the same time, you can also find examples within the the the, the LGBTQ, for instance, uh, movements uh, that have been studied in the U.S. as well. Uh, marriage equality sort of uh, became a front runner, whereas others have tried to the more radical activists who tried to say we need to question you know, the institution of marriage itself. Those uh, scholars document how they have become sidelined and marginalized. So again, uh, not unique. And the compromise is not just between the state and the activists, also within social movement uh, divisions itself uh, as well. All right. Sorry, I'm not gonna answer your question, but uh, yeah, at least I have a response. <laughs> Well, thanks, Lynette, for for your response. Uh, we're we're at time, uh, and I know you have to to go also. So I think we will wrap there. But I did want to thank you uh, very very much for uh, discussing your book with us today, uh, for your presentation, which was uh, very thought provoking. I've had all sorts of ideas pop up in my head uh, about you know wider conversations that should be had uh, had around sort of uh, rights politics uh, and across regions. Uh, so uh, you'll doubtlessly hear more from me about that. Thanks to Srila for her comments. Thanks to everyone who's come and gone. Uh, and yeah, um, thanks so much, everyone. Uh, really enjoyed this. Uh, thank you. Uh, have a good day. And uh, I look, look forward to further exchanges with you and the center. And thanks, Srila. Thank you so much, Lynette. I look forward to
after all your work. All right. Hope to see you at the conference. Bye-bye. All right.